minutes late. Uh, uh, some of us have a jet lag. <laughs> uh, but uh, the most interesting part is coming. Um, I was thinking about this rotating beam. So this was actually our first demonstration, and I believe it's the first demonstration of a generalized rotating beam. That is, uh, we can control here the what is a rotation rate, the total rotation from the waist to infinity. Uh, and so this is the first demonstration where we see, okay, this is actually rotating through the waist and in the far field, and we measure the angle of rotation, and this is the theoretical curve. So as you can see, these things rotate a lot in the waist, and then, of course, towards the far field, they become more or less constant. So it's a strong rotation, and then we can rotate. But this is a critical point for us in the sense of uh, having high sensitivity to, to depth, because in the waist, we know that the Gaussian beam changes very little in the waist, essentially, it's essentially constant along, along the radial range. Okay? While the rotating beams have the maximum rotation in the waist. Okay? So you see, angle as a function of distance is maximum there. So, in some sense, they are more sensitive to depth variation, and that's what we're going to use later on. So, for an imaging system, uh, we go. We are not going to generate beams, we are going to uh, generate point spread functions. But it's essentially the same uh, fun, the same hologram or face mask that we are going to place on, uh, on the pupil plane of, of the imaging system. So if you have a lens and you look at different planes, you get a spot that changes uh, the depth. Okay? It's just changing the size. Now if you put the, this hologram or mask uh, in the pupil plane, we're going to get a rotating point spread function as we move in different planes. And this is a three dimensional uh, point spread function of essentially the same information. Here you have the focus, here you have it's a, a double P in three dimension space. So uh, I explained uh, heuristically that this is a, a more sensitivity to depth because uh, there's maximum rotation in the focal uh, region uh, as opposed to minimum change of a Gaussian or a clear aperture focus uh, beam. So uh, this is what we uh, are going to try to show that you can get axial super resolution quote in quotes. Because super resolution is, uh, is in different uh, ways. And uh, we are going to uh, find a metric based on information theory to tell that this is a more accurate for precision localization. So uh, from now on, we're going to talk about a series of uh, systems that are based on this simple principle. If this is a 4F system. Uh, we place a mask that generates these uh, helical beams in the Fourier plane, and so if you have point sources at different Z locations. At the detector, you're going to see, rather than see uh, spots, you're going to see for each point source, you're going to see two spots. And I'm going to the position, which I'm going to rotate. Okay? So you, by looking at the angle of rotation, you can, from a single image, tell the three-dimensional position. Also from here, you can tell the three-dimensional position, but you could not distinguish between this and that. Here they are blue and red just for clarity, but these two are the same. But here we break the symmetry, so we see different angles. So that's how we uh, uh, We've used this principle to uh, make uh, 3D images. Here we have a penny. This is an uh, American penny, sorry. This is a T of the World Liberty. This is a Lincoln, which is a small guy that is there in the Lincoln. In the and in this case, uh, because we have continuous objects, not just points, also, we take two images. And from these two images, we reconstruct the topography. So this is like a profilometer, but without scanning. Just two images, you get the depth map. And this depth map, the resolution depth is much better than the, the axial resolution of the magnitude. 
So uh, block diagrams, you take two images, one regular image using the standard uh, impulse response of PSF and one with a rotated PSF, and then you perform a deconvolution. So this, to show how the, instead of showing the equations, I'm going to show an example. So we take two images, and you see the regular image has a, 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 a in focus, and the, this one has every object that appears twice because you have two points. And then from these two images, you can recover the points of the function, you look at this angle, and you can tell the position. So as we move this object back and forth, you see that the, this rotates, okay? And the angle tells you the position. Now, uh, for point sources, which is uh, of interest to us, uh, this plot is, is even uh, better because uh, here we have a, this is a bright field 3D microscope. So we have, uh, we took a piece of glass and made a defect with a Kankos laser. So we have five uh, defects and different depths. Now, from this image, you can see that this form will be the same, so you cannot tell the depth. They are always in the depth of field. While here, in the double helix, you can see that they, are, they have different angles. From those angles, you can tell the depth. It's the same object. So here, as you move back and forth, in this one, as you move back and forth, you can see they have better sensitivity to depth. Again, for example, if you look at this one, you cannot distinguish between these two, but here, it's clear. Okay, so you can find a position with nanometer accuracy uh, and we calculate the, the precision by taking repeated the measurement a hundred times. Okay, so then you get the, the sigma of this dimension. Okay, the metric we use to uh, calculate, to compare different techniques is called the Kramer's Raw Bar. So this is an a information theoretical metric. Essentially, it's a number that tells you what is the best precision you can get uh, in the human system. Okay? And it's a function of the derivatives of the probability density functions with respect to the parameter you want to measure. To make it simpler, if you try to measure temperature with a mercury thermometer, you look at how much uh, the, the the thermal coefficient of, of the mercury, how much the length changes with temperature. You are not measuring temperature, you measure the length of the mercury code. If you use alcohol, you're going to get a different variation. Okay? And you want to find, to use the one that changes the most with a, a change in temperature. Okay? So here is the same, you want to use the point space function that changes the most with the change in, in depth. And that's the principle. And uh, you can quantify that uh, using this Kramer's uh, Raw. Uh, and so you can compare the different systems. Um, and it can be proved that the Kramer's Raw Bar is the minimum variance of any estimator and bias that you use uh, for this uh, estimation. So it doesn't matter how you're going to do the calculation, the best you can do is given by this one, which I think is very interesting. And it's related to what is a measurement of the prior talk. Okay? Uh, ultimately, as I say, you don't measure the temperature, you're measuring the length of the mercury or some other property. And you need to find the, how this uh, magnitude is related. So uh, what you get at plots uh, that look like this, for example, uh, this is a CRB, which is a the minimum bias, as a function of Z. And uh, this is for a lens, this is for a, a double helix. Now in this case we assume that uh, we are saturating the detector. So we have, they don't have the same number of photons, they have the same maximum of intensity. So this is for Z, X, and Y, and we see that this is always below, meaning lower variance, that's better. Uh, so that, that shows that the double helix is better in this case. And uh, these are what we call detector limits because in the problem like the one I show here, uh, this is a material, so you can, in uh, bright field, you can shine as much light as you want. Right? So it's, the limitation is going to be until you saturate the detector. 
with the gut immunity. Uh, you can also do dark field microscopy, okay? Se similar thing, we implement this in special light moderators, I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, and you can also use it in fluorescence. Okay, so these are fluorescent beads, and this is a standard poison function. This is double helix, and here I'm going to show a movie. These are fluorescent beads moving. And here you see, you see a spot, but here you also see the orientation of the two spots that gives you the location. So you can track in 3D. And precisions are going to depend on the number of photons collected and the noise, things like that. But they are keeping in the nanometer range. Okay, so you can track multiple particles in parallel. Now, uh, you need to compare with other techniques. So what other techniques are used? One of the techniques that is used is the digital holography. So essentially, recording a hologram of each particle. Well, recording a hologram of a fluorescent particle is complicated because it's, a, it's not coherent light. So you don't have a reference. So you need to make self interference of the same particle. It's doable, but it's complicated. The other problem is that if you record a hologram of a single particle, essentially it looks like a Fresnel, a Fresnel lens, a set of rings, and it's, it's wider. It takes a lot, much more space than this, and so they start overlapping when you have multiple more particles, and that's a problem. Also, the more you spread the light, you have a limited number of photons as in fluorescent imaging, if you're spreading the light, you're uh, increasing the signal to noise. So uh, this is a compromise between having everything focused. The, the next good thing to having only one spot is having two spots. <coughs> so uh, if you are generating rings and other patterns, you're spreading too much light. So you don't want to spread it too much, but if you don't spread it, you're not going to be able to uh, find the Z position. So two spots is kind of a compromise and a if it works. Okay, uh, these are calculations. Again, when you calculate this crevice uh, you need to look at the, the level of noise, but also the distribution of noise. It, it's, it's going to be a Poisson distribution, Gaussian distribution. So in the photon limit case, we use Poisson distribution. And again, you can see that you get a mostly lower CRV, or variance, and also a more constant, that means that you can make these measurements of a long range in Z. Um, here we compare uh, these double helices, two types of double helix functions, function, the other methods that I mentioned before, the biplane and the astigmatic, and we can show that we are always below, or you can always find the double helix that is below the others, meaning that uh, that's what we want. We want to have a lower fairness of bound, lower value. And always you need to assume what is the greater aperture, the magnification, so pixel size, volume. All these parameters are increasing in this calculation. Um, <coughs> what is the effect of the bandwidth? Uh, any, if you are working in fluorescence, and these are the beautiful fluorophores, they have some bandwidth, so they are not uh, like a laser. So we want to know, uh, you see this is about 100 nanometers, what happens when you change the wavelengths for this uh, double helix? Well, you still get rotation similar for about 100 nanometers. So bandwidth is okay, uh, uh, and it still works if you have a slight uh, deviation. And uh, the way we implement this is with a, a spatial modulator, and we do this on axis. We don't use a carrier. And one of the problems is that we lose half of the photons because we need to use polarized light. Okay? Because it's a really crystal, so only one polarization goes through. And I'm going to go back to this. So this is a big drawback because you're losing half of the photons. Now, in the, going back to PAL, uh, this type of microscopy super resolution, now, we put this face mask implemented with, a, with a, for example, SLM. And now, so for each molecule, we get two spots. 
and we repeat that, same as before, but now we get a 3D image, okay? And, and this was a demonstrated, and we could resolve in collaboration with W. Merma, molecules that are close as, say, about 20 nanometers in speed. So this is a definition of resolution. There are two molecules that are close about 20 nanometers, can we tell them apart? Yes. So that means that we essentially are building the diffraction in three dimensions by a lot of magnitude. Of course, the resolution here is clearly uh, related to the signal to noise, to the number of photons you take. And you can you repeat this measurement multiple times and build these histograms of the, 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 of the position. Of, the, uh, of these molecules, and then that gives you an idea of the resolution. There is a gimbal, but it's about uh, 30 nanometers. Uh, other techniques uh, have achieved similar uh, results using the astigmatic, uh, using a uh, cylindrical lens, and uh, also using two objective lenses. Two objective lenses has uh, an advantage that you collect twice the light, so just by that you are increasing by a uh, uh, square root of two uh, signal to noise. And uh, they also use interference. So this is very, very cool, but very complicated. Okay? And also has a very shallow depth of field. The, the depth of field here, or the, the range that you can measure is 200 nanometers, while with the double helix you can measure two microns for similar parameters. But this is also a pushing the limits. But we have a lot of uh, custom optics and two objectives which limit the space here. Um, recently we did these uh, experiments where we look at the polarization sensitivity to the imaging. So the idea is that molecules are not uh, point sources, they are dipoles. Okay? So ultimately we want to find the not only the position but the orientation of these dipoles. And so we use polarization sensitive imaging. So uh, essentially, this looks complicated, but it's the same 4F system with a mask in the Fourier plane. Uh, but uh, here we use the same system twice, one for each polarization. So uh, we have two paths that go through the same specialized modulator. And this one pass, so this is the calibration curve for the PSL. This is the other pass. <coughs> Each pass is a different orthogonal polarization. And the advantage of this is that now we use all the photons. And in order to use the same SLM twice, we use a, a quarter weight plate to uh, rotate the, the polarization. And it's a half point. Plate. And the other thing is, uh, but you could also use two specialized locators. But the key is that you use a, a polarizing distributor to divide the two polarizations. And we Recycle all the photos with the shape of the mask, and uh, so you get uh, horizontal or vertical images. Uh, the results look something like this. This is a, a, a biological cell, it's pretty thin uh, cells, and uh, the molecules are GF, GFP, which is contact rateable GFP. And for each point here, we have two spots, and we find the position. This is a, a horizontal channel, X, Z projection, and Y, Z projection. So we get a 3D from one channel and a 3D from another channel. And one of the things we observe uh, is that the two images look different, meaning that you can you have a different the contrast mechanism. Okay? You, have, you can tell from from this polarization, it gets different information than from this. So apart from the brightness, you can get information from the polarization. This is still not uh, far from uh, finding the orientation of each molecule, but it's one step in that direction. And the other thing is that you can combine, if you find a correspondent uh, spots here, you can combine the information and improve the localization. Essentially, it's like taking two measurements, you can provide information, and here we did that with a beam. So we have a horizontal channel, vertical, 
and combining you can reduce the uncertainty. As usual, if you take two measurements, you can improve it. Your uncertainty is reduced. And interestingly enough, if, if there's no a background or rhythm noise, you can get the same precision in localization that you get if all the photos were to only one channel. Okay, uh, lately we've done the improvements, and instead of looking at the angle here, we are using an optimized estimator, which is a maximum likelihood estimator. And essentially, we are <coughs> this is the measurement. We are looking at the, the from the calibration curves, the best match to this, and we can tell the, the position. And we went from a say 20 nanometers in X and Y and 40 in, in, in Z. Now these are a bit higher because we have lower photos. For these molecules we have over a thousand photos per uh, image. So with the maximum uh, likelihood estimator we can reduce the uncertainty even by a factor of two almost. So the volume is reduced by a factor of four. So this is the uncertainty volume reduced by a factor of almost four. And these are, I would say, typical values because we found in better cases where we have about uh, 12 nanometers in x, y, and z. So this is very encouraging. It takes a, a bit longer computation on, but uh, with current computers, this is something you can do parallel with pretty fast. Uh, now, one problem we have for the maximum likelihood is that. These are the calibration images. And you see here we have aberrations. So that, that's a problem, but that's real life. So it, this is a mostly due to the SLM because we came in at two angles. So we did, did the SLM at normal image. So we have aberrations, and in order to match the best uh, pattern to one specific image, we need to have, we, we cannot calibrate for all the for every nanometer in depth. So we, we get, say, 10 images, and we want to find the images in between. And the way to do that is, is in phase retrieval. Okay, so essentially propagating these between different planes to interpolate the points per fraction in three dimensions. And using that, we, we could achieve uh, this uh, uh, first answer I showed you before. So essentially we calculate the phase. Of, of this distribution. Uh, and so you can build 3D maps. This is a biological cell, but we are not showing any specific features. Now we are working with biologists to actually uh, use this in an uh, interesting application. Okay? This is, a, again, the same uh, 2DK1 cells, and, uh, which is a rat kangaroo. And, uh, uh, just showing that we can localize these molecules with high precision. Okay, so uh, what is the fundamental limit now? It's not diffraction. What is the fundamental limit for uh, this type of techniques? Well, uh, there is a, a limitation here by the photon mass nature of light. So you need more photons to improve the solution. Uh, and if you try to localize one molecule, there is a, a inevitability of noise. And the point source function can improve localization in three dimensions. Okay. So now, if you go to this uh, palm or stone techniques, what is it? you have that localization limit, but you also have the fact that molecules interact among them. So if you have two molecules that are very close, say the molecules are a few nanometers inside, in size, and if you have two molecules that are a uh, few nanometers apart, they're going to interact. So that's a problem. Uh, they could generate inhibition of the fluorescence, and also the molecule size. If you have a molecule that is three nanometers, what is the point of giving a uh, position that is better than three nanometers? So people think that the limit of resolution now is going to be around five nanometers or so. And clearly, one of the tasks is to check the uh, engineer molecules that are brighter. So because sigma or the localization and ultimately the resolution is uh, you know, scales like one over the square root of n. So you want to have 
large number of organisms. Okay. But the examples we were looking at were here. Now, uh, here we have three curves. Uh, the black is the, using the angle estimator, which is the quick, easy estimator where you look at the angle of the two lobes. And MLP CRB, which is in blue, is the minimum possible, and the red is the, what we can achieve with the MLP, so we can actually achieve the best possible uh, estimation precision uh, based on the system. So th this is really exciting because this is the fundamental for a given point of the So, uh, I'm going to conclude it here. What I to show is uh, that super resolution is now possible. So that, that, that's a take home message. And there are many techniques. There, there is a state that found that there are other techniques that take into account the time sequence. Uh, we show uh, that for uh, some of these techniques, three dimensional function construction engineering is, is useful because we can improve the estimation of the, of the position and in particular we show the double degree for the function. And many of these techniques require this computational imaging. We require a lot of uh, computation, uh, optimization, model decomposition, uh, time correlation, frame response, maximum likelihood, face retrieval and more. So um, all these techniques are advanced techniques, uh, but they are uh, known, and the application of these methods uh, are, well, are, there are a few papers in Nature Methods appeared last month on the, just this problem, how to fit uh, data to, uh, to, to a curve, okay? Just simple method that people use, uh, Gaussian fitting or uh, least squares, and they show those are not optimal. There are better methods and maximum likelihood is one of those uh, optimal methods. So, a lot of uh, computational, what we call optical, because these methods have to be matched. It's not just signal processing after the fact, it's uh, designing the optics together with the algorithms to get the result. Okay. That's what we call computational optimal. I would like to thank the team, the current and Prior students, one of them is here, tell me. Uh, Sean Curry and Vinny Sharma are currently working on this. Prasanna uh, uh, graduated and uh, has left the group now. Alan Greenberg will work in, uh, in the first stages of, the, of this double uh, DVD work. And uh, the rest of the students also collaborate. Also, Anurag is working now on this project. So uh, the limitation here is how many photos each molecule emits. If you get a brighter molecule, less time. On the other side, if you get better algorithm for estimation of position, you can get away with less photos. So all these methods are in that direction to reduce the time. Now, it uh, also depends on how many molecules you want to locate. Okay? So it depends on the density of molecules. But right now it could take uh, one hour, uh, more than one hour to uh, take one of these images. But people is looking into minutes. Okay. But it's still uh, slow. Now one advantage I, I forgot to mention is that 
instead of uh, structure illumination methods, you need to uh, excite each molecule multiple times. But in this uh, palm and stone methods, each molecule it's enough that it emits only once. So there is less photo damage in photo collision than in the other methods. Um, in my view, the, the, there's not going to be a single bullet for all the problems. The more uh, we want to reach the limits, the more uh, the systems need to be more specific to the task you are uh, attempting to achieve. So, in some situations, state could be better, but it requires a lot of power and it's a scanning method. In some situations, you might want to, to use the uh, palm uh, methods. So, uh, but again, it, it's going to depend on having optimal methods and uh, for post processing and system design, but also the molecules that are right there. And that's a whole field of uh, study for uh, biochemistry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we can talk about this later, but uh, in one of the a few slides where you showed an example of an experiment with PSF that had some aberrations and the two lobes weren't equal, mm -hmm. some of that was due to incorrection in the system, some of it was due to the fact that we're using SLM off axis. Yeah. Could we use the SLM to fix those aberrations? Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> 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 no, one problem is that we were using the SLM uh, for two. Twice, so you can correct only for one of the channels, not for the other. But uh, in this case, in this case, it's uh, interesting because the method is independent of whether you are using a double helix or any three-dimensional point source function. Uh, is good. Uh, this method is good for any 3D point source function, not necessarily for a double helix. Uh, and that was is one of the points here. That whatever the point source function, whatever the operations. This method is still optimal. Any further yeah. questions? In the polarized yeah. version, uh, what, what do you use to uh, to find the orientation of the molecules in 3D? Okay, so, uh, so uh, what, what what said, we didn't find the orientation this this uh, work. This is one step. So uh, to find orientations, there are different approaches. Uh, if you have, if you want to do it in parallel for multiple molecules, some people just look at the pattern. Okay. Uh, according to the dipole, the diffraction pattern of the dipole, the far field is going to be different according to the orientation. But there are some ambiguity. So you need, in general, some other uh, measurements. Some people propose to do uh, three men, three polarization measures, which should be uh, the best in, in theory, but then you are splitting the photos in three images, which is worse. So uh, that's still, a, I would say, an open problem. There are some results uh, that you, you can measure the orientation, but uh, in my opinion, they are still not, not, not optimal. But uh, using two measurements, uh, what we show is that you can first use the, all the photos for the SLM, okay, because the SLM has uh, polarization, and second, that uh, you can uh, get different images that tell you, could tell you something about the, the object. Okay. That's a polarization image. It's a different mechanism of uh, contrast. Okay. Contrast means that you can tell that there is something in an image that, uh, and so if you get different images in two, uh, for the two polarization, you can tell something uh, about the object. Do you have to assume that the molecule cannot rotate? Sorry again? To discover the orientation of the molecules. Do you have to assume that the molecules cannot rotate? Right. So uh, what happens normally is that the molecules are not fixed. Okay. So they, got, they are free to move. Uh, around some range of angles, so you get a blur there. So uh, in all these methods, uh, the other trick I say you need to use some nonlinearity and you need to have some prior knowledge. <laughs> and the prior knowledge uh, is hidden here because you know what the 
what the molecules are. Because you, are, you know the molecules, you know what the lasers you need to use to excite those molecules. So there's a lot of prior knowledge which uh, is, uh, is hidden in these methods. But um, ultimately you can distinguish. Uh, so those are the tricks that allow you to build the diffraction limit. Right? Mm -hmm. No. Sorry, Sorry Rafa, I think I think you might have said this already. Why don't you use L equals plus or minus two with four loads? Because mm. that would be far more that would be more sensitive, of course, wouldn't it? Mm. In the actual direction to rotation. Uh, I can L plus so so double, L you use a double helix, so that's like plus or minus one. Yes. But if you use a higher order load, let's say plus or minus two, yes. would that not be more sensitive? Okay, uh, yeah, I, this is, uh, let me, okay, you have this uh, gauss Lager model plane, yeah. and the rate of rotation is given by the slope of the line, okay? So you can, in principle, get higher rate of rotation. The question is, how much energy is actually rotating? Because you can have something that is like a big background, and very low contrast rotation. And that's not good. You want to have all the energy rotating, like these two loads. So, so a faster rotation is not necessarily good. You need all the energy rotating in that thing. Uh, and when you do the uh, Kremers Raman calculation, that shows something. Because uh, you integrate over the variations, over the gradient, uh, and, and that's uh, what counts. So, so uh, I'm not saying no, uh, but, but um, in fact, ultimately the best and very good results, <laughs> uh, because uh, also these analytic results give you things that work from zero to infinity, but you want to focus on a narrow uh, distance, so the best solutions are typically uh, numerical results. When you run in the or when you're imaging particles this small, do you run into the problem that the imaging laser is just moving the particles around that you're trying to image? Can you repeat it? Um, when you're imaging particles this small, yes. Do you run into the problem that the imaging laser is moving the particle around? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we repeat this measurement. Uh, when, when times to evaluate the, the precision. Okay, so if if the particle was moving, we'll get a, a, a bias that is due to the movement of the particle. Okay, so we know that that's smaller than say 20 nanometers or 10 nanometers, whatever the bias of that of that uh, distribution is. Huh. So uh, by measuring multiple times, you can uh, tell if it's moving or not. In fact. Yeah, what we, we even found that the you know, so like we have this nano position PSO capacitive sensing uh, devices, and we find that they drift uh, over time. And so, so we are getting better than the, you know, the devices you, you can buy to actually calibrate this thing. Okay. But um, you'll see that, okay? Because when we characterize, we One, one thing that I didn't mention is that we correct for three. When you integrate images for an hour, say, the system is going to move. So we have a fiduciary bits, fluorescent bits, that we can correct for the drift of the, of the sun. So those things are, there is a lot of the, the things to, to take into account. Thank you very much.